This episode of Empire is brought to you by QuickNode. QuickNode is an end-to-end -end blockchain development platform that makes building Web3 apps super easy. No matter what you want to build, you can effortlessly develop any application by leveraging their Elastic APIs. Go to quicknode.com, use code Empire. You'll get a free month on their feature-backed build plan. That's right. Go to quicknode.com. You'll get a free month to start playing around. You'll hear more about QuickNode later on the show. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Empire. Uh, really lucky to be joined by uh, Forward Guidance host Jack Farley and Joseph Wang. If you don't know Joseph Wang, uh, he's also known as Fed Guy on Twitter. Joseph is the CIO of uh, Monetary Macro and previously a senior trader on the open markets desk at the Fed. So, uh, Jack, Joseph, welcome to Empire, guys. Great to be here, Jason. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Jack, I feel like I'm I'm stepping into your camp here. I'm definitely uh this is a crypto podcast turning macro for the for this crazy week in the markets. Joseph, I want to pick on you for what I think might be the hardest question of this entire conversation, which is just how did we get here today? Yeah, so listen, the banking sector has been kind of asleep for for a long time. So we had this big bank failure, Silicon Valley Bank, two hundred billion dollars. Sounds like a lot, but historically speaking, you know, banks fail all the time. Just over the past 20 years, we had 500 banks fail. Now, Silicon Valley Bank is a bit different because it's a bit larger than those smaller banks many have never heard of. But let's have some context here. JP Morgan is $3.5 trillion in assets. Silicon Valley Bank, $200 billion. So Silicon Valley Bank is not even a tenth the size of JP Morgan. Now, if you have any, any business sector, you're going to have some banks that are badly run. Now, there are a few thousand banks in the US. Some of them are badly run and one of them is Silicon Valley Bank. Now, if we actually look into how they ran their business, you can understand why their failure is it's really not surprising. So when you're a bank, you have to manage your assets and your liabilities. So at a high level, a bank borrows short and lends long. When I take money and I deposit it in a bank, what I'm really doing is, I'm, is that I'm lending money to a bank. So if I put $1,000 into Silicon Valley Bank, uh, Silicon Valley Bank is borrowing $1,000 from me, and I can take that money back anytime I want. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank, on their asset side, will often buy either securities or, or make loans. So the fundamental problem a bank has to solve is to make sure that it has enough assets to meet the potential redemptions that its investors have. By the way, if you are a depositor, you are an investor. You are lending the money. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank managed themselves very differently from other banks. So if you are any other bank, when you have, when you manage your deposits, you want to make sure that you have a mix so that you won't have any uh, sudden runs. Banks can do this in a lot of different ways. One way is to issue a lot of CDs. If you have a CD, a certificate of deposit, well, let's say it's a one-year CD, then contractually, you, uh, a depositor can't take their money back until that, that one year is up. So boom, you manage your liabilities. You don't have to worry about any runs. Another very common way that banks manage their liabilities is to make sure that they have a deposit base that's largely insured. So if you have a bank account that's less than $250,000, you're insured by the government. So no matter what happens to the bank, you don't really care. You are a very stable depositor. Most banks have, let's say, about 50 to 60% of their deposit base insured. If you're a small bank, it could be much higher. Now, Silicon Valley Bank, almost all of its deposits were uninsured, so over 90%. And that's because they went after the business of high net worth individuals and corporations. Now, that's a very, very vulnerable mix because these guys, they are uninsured depositors. The second something's wrong, they have an incentive to bolt. And they did bolt. And uh, what seemed to pre precipitate this is that on the asset side, Silicon Valley Bank bought $120 billion of um, long dated securities, rates went higher, and that $120 billion is now worth $100 billion. So they had about $20 billion in unrealized losses. Some can say that maybe they were insolvent. Um, but that, of course, depends on whether or not everyone asks for their money back at the same time. You hold something that is uh, underwater, eventually it converges to par value again. Uh, but we did not give Silicon Valley Bank uh, time to do that. If you look at their loan portfolio, you know, they're famous for making loans to all sorts of startups. That doesn't seem to have been a very good business these days. It was great a couple of years ago, but uh, so it, it, it's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, in my view, was just the poorly run bank who went bust. Right. And mm -hmm. the 
um, for, for, for Silicon Valley Bank, uh, it was those depositors who, who pulled their money. That happened on Friday. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation took it over, shut it down. On Saturday, we had a sort of a day of rest. On Sunday, the uh, FDIC, the Fed, and the Treasury came out with a joint statement announcing that they had shut down another bank, Signature Bank, and that um, all deposits would be made whole above the $250,000 uh, threshold. So all deposits, not just insured deposits. And then the Federal Reserve has a new program where it will lend against uh, eligible collateral for a, a term of up to one year. Uh, so, so that's just to set the stage. And then I'll also put this chart um, on screen, which just is of uh, the sort of chaos that we're having in the market right now. It's 1044 AM. First Republic Bank down 65%. By the way, it was down a lot on Friday. The, the, the KBW Regional Banks Index down like 10 or 11%. So th there is a lot of blood in the streets here. So Joseph, I know you pointed about how Silicon Valley Bank was a you know, unique incident. They had insurance um, it, it, deposits that were not insured, business accounts, people pulled their money. But what gives you confidence that this isn't systemic? Because yesterday we had Signature Bank collapse. Now First Republic Bank, you know, I hope they make it. There's a one across the street from me. I love First Republic Bank, but the stock's down 65. percent What 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 are you what gives you confidence that you know th things will be okay here? Yeah, so that's a really really striking chart. But what's also striking is that I think for the audience, most people have never heard of those banks. So this is actually a bank. This is largely a banking crisis for banks that people have never heard of. Medium banks, smaller banks. Now they they are good banks. A lot of them I, I've seen before and I've looked into. So a lot of them are good banks. But in the banking sector, the assets are heavily consolidated. So the top five banks in the U.S. account for about half of all the banking sector assets. So you know, like like many other industries, it's kind of a winner take all industry. So even if you have a whole lot of small banks disappear, it doesn't really have systemic importance. Another way to think about this is that contagion happens largely through the financial markets. So if you remember Lehman, Lehman was heavily integrated into the financial markets, big market participant. A lot of people traded with them. A lot of people had counterparty risk with them. And they, when they went under, everyone that was entangled with them went down. But all these banks, they are, you know, they, they're basically like big local banks. They make a lot of loans to local, uh, local businesses and so forth, but they're not really enmeshed with the global financial system. So when, if they were, and I don't think this will happen, but if many of them failed, you know, it, it doesn't really spill over to everything else in the world the way that a Lehman would, the way that a globally connected, systemically important bank would. So I think a lot of this is, is just panic. Um, First Republic, I can kind of understand. First Republic is actually based in San Francisco. And uh, many people can see that and kind of link them with um, Silicon Valley Bank. But they're actually very different in their business model. Uh, for example, First Republic, instead of buying a whole bunch of long-dated securities, makes a whole lot of loans. And they also have a larger percentage of the deposits insured. So Silicon Valley Bank, maybe 90 plus percent was uninsured deposits. Um, but you know, for for First Republic, it's still higher than average. It's, it's probably like sixty five percent and so forth. But it's it's much less. And something else that's happening today is, as you mentioned, Jack, the Fed rolled out, took out the bazooka. They took out a term bank something funding facility, which actually breaks all the rules of central banking and is a terrible terrible mistake. Uh, but that being said, they'll probably see that it doesn't work, and they'll probably go even further. So I would not be surprised if they announced something like a full deposit uh, mm -hmm. guarantee, just like they bailed out all the depositors in Silicon Valley Bank, it stands to reason that they're willing to do this. And why not do this now uh, when it's actually costless to do so? Joseph, you mentioned something that uh, answered my first question, which you, you said that SVB made these kind of bad loans to startups, right? But my understanding of this whole situation is that this is not actually the case of bad loans. The true cul culprit here is not, in fact, credit risk, like maybe 2008, 2009, but it's interest rate risk. Can you maybe just unpack that a little bit for us? Sure, sure. That's a really good point. And so so when interest rates, so the price of an asset right, can go up or down for various factors. If you have a fixed income security or a fixed income loan, um, the asset price can go down when rates go higher. And like I mentioned earlier, 
Silicon Valley Bank had $120 billion worth. Okay, so they have $210 billion in assets. And of that, $120 billion were securities, fixed rate securities, basically. And so when the Fed began aggressively raising rates, uh, the value of those securities went down from $120 billion to about $100 billion. So they had $20 billion in unrealized losses. Now, I mentioned the credit side as well. Uh, because they also hold loans. And you know, if you have a lot of stress in the tech sector, especially in the startup tech sector, the value of those loans will go down, uh, not just with interest rate going higher, but also because there's some credit. But the overall takeaway is that their asset values uh, were lower. There was a lot of unrealized losses on those assets. And that's really, really important for a bank when you need to raise cash. When everyone is taking money out of the bank, a bank has to use its assets either sell them or borrow against them to raise cash to meet those outflows. But you can only raise cash against market value, not what you put on your accounting books. And so when you have $20 billion in unrealized losses on your securities and they were unhedged, that means there's $20 billion less you can borrow against. And that might not be enough to uh, meet all your deposit outflows. And in this case, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. The last thing they could do is they could actually use their loans and borrow from the Fed. But again, those loans values, I'm guessing, are also not worth that much. Okay, so so, so you're a bank, you buy a treasury bond or, or, or a bond, you have interest rate risk if the interest rates go higher, which will cause the uh, price of the existing bonds that you have to go down. Most banks, I feel like, would have hedged here. Um, and they would have maybe entered into a derivative agreement called an interest rate swap. Uh, my understanding was always that all banks hedge their risk with these swaps. Why didn't, is, is this the key problem that SVB didn't hedge their risk here? It, it is a, it is one of the big problems. So there's actually some, some so so first of all, you, you're totally right. If you are a well-run bank, you would want, you want to have some hedge, interest rate hedges, right? Especially since almost all your portfolio was exposed to interest rates. But again, you know, Silicon Valley Bank is not like other banks. Um, but th there is some, there is some logic behind this as well. So in the banking industry, you can. There are different ways you can account for your securities. You can account them as held to market, held to maturity, or available for sale. Uh, held to maturity means that you hold this and you promise to never sell it. So, if you buy a treasury for hundred dollars, and eventually, let's say interest rates rise and it declines to ninety dollars in value, well, you don't actually have to mark that on your books because you promise to hold it to maturity, and at maturity. You know, the market, because treasuries have no credit risk, they'll ultimately pay off and that $90 will go back to $100. Um, so what Silicon Valley Bank did was they basically, um, you know, they did not want to show that they had losses and uh, maybe they totally bet on interest rates staying low forever. They basically all moved it to held to maturity. Well, not all of it, a lot of it. So they technically did not have to hedge uh, and could basically show on their books that they had treasuries booked at $100. They had some that they that were available sale that sh they should have hedged, but like you suggested, they did not hedge at all. So this was uh, not just poor management on the interest rate risk side, but also on the whole strategy on how to manage your asset portfolio, buying a whole bunch of long-dated um, securities, and mm -hmm. then just holding them to maturity. Right. And uh, Joseph, so there's hold to maturity available for sale. Available for sale is AFS is the acronym. You know, finance people love to give acronyms everything. Uh, hold to maturity is, is HTM. And you've got a great piece on fedguide.com called hit to market instead of hold, hold to market. I also think HTM could stand for you just like hide the money because Silicon Valley Bank had all of these assets, treasuries and mortgage backed securities, agency mortgage backed securities. So, you know, very little credit risk, but tons of interest rate risk. And that gets worse and worse. Uh, I mean, I calculated like back of the envelope that if they were marking to market, the value of, of their securities would go down a billion dollars for every single 25 basis point increase in rates. And, you know, the Federal Reserve did 75 basis points increases in a single day, like many times uh, or the FO FOMC meeting. Um, so, yep. so Silicon Valley Bank did horrible risk management because they did not hedge interest rates. But what have you looked at, uh, you know, that other banks, the stocks that are down you know, 20 to 30 percent today. I mean, Charles Schwab, uh, 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 WAL, all, all these all these bank companies. Um, to what degree do you think they've had hedged interest rate risk? Because I looked at um, uh, First Republic Bank and I looked under the derivatives contracts 
and they had some foreign exchange contracts, but I didn't see any interest rate hedges at all. And this is a bank that's very well respected in the industry. And also it's kind of perverse because they have a very high quality mortgage, um, you know, something like 10, almost no one defaults on their mortgages. They, they have very good credit underwriting standards, but it's almost, it's pretty perverse because the the better your credit is, the lower your yields are going to be, and therefore the higher, more sensitive they are to interest rates. So I don't even know how mortgage loans, not mortgage-backed securities, but mortgage loans, how you mark the, the those values as, as interest rates rise. So uh, yeah, how, how, how systemic do you think this is? I mean, do you, do you think that the banks are hedging? Obviously, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they're hedging, they're fine. But what about the peers of First Republic and its peers? And also the duration risk, you know, Joseph, as you first taught me, you know, uh, 15, 16 months ago, the Federal Reserve imposes losses on the financial system as it raises rates. Yes, I can sell a swap to, to, uh, to Jason. You can sell a swap to, to Joseph and the losses get moved around, but the losses are still there, right? Yeah, you're exactly right. So, um, but you have to look at the equity side as well. You have more losses, but I mean, look at the price of home values, look at the price of stocks and look at all the um, free money that the federal government sent into the system. You also have more equity as well, but the losses, the losses can become large if we continue to hike rates. But in the case of First Republic, so I think part of the reason why they don't have interest rate hedges is that they don't have a very big, uh, actually they don't really have any securities portfolio. Very different from um, Silicon Valley Bank, rather than buy a whole bunch of securities, they went out and they made a whole bunch of loans. And a lot of those loans, like you mentioned, Jeff, are mortgage loans. Now, the loan treatment for accounting is a bit different from securities. There's no available for sale for the loan portfolio. So you don't actually market to market. You hold it for maturity. It's held for investment. And if you hold something for maturity, you don't really have a need to hedge it. And so that's probably why they don't really hedge their interest rate risk. It's because they're committed to holding those mortgages until they mature. And as you mentioned, that doesn't mean that their market value doesn't decline. And so, so far, I'm sure their market value for their loans has declined a lot as well. I believe that was also disclosed on one of their recent annual reports. And that could be part of the reason why people are panicking. They're afraid that, you know, maybe that uh, this First Republic Bank, it might be insolvent, just like uh, Silicon Valley Bank. But, you know, the Fed, this is a common problem in banks. When you have something like this, what would happen is that First Republic rather than selling their securities, could take their mortgages and they could borrow from the Fed at the Fed discount window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how, how is the, the discount window is, you know, that that's always there. How is the discount window different than the new uh, uh, facility, the bank term lending program or something? Yeah, so the discount facility, so for those of you who, who are not familiar with this, so um, a central bank in its basic function acts as lender of last resort. So if a bank Let's say they have a lot of good assets, but suddenly don't have enough cash on hand to meet everyone asking for their money back. What a bank can do is that they can go to the Fed and borrow against their good assets, get some cash, and meet the uh, withdrawals. Uh, the central bank is trying to calm banking panics. Before there was a Fed, oftentimes people would panic, take all their money out of the bank. The bank did not have enough cash on hand and would potentially fail. And that was really bad for everyone. And so now we have a central bank, they're acting as lender of last resort. The basic principle of lending of la uh, as a lender of last resort is that a central bank lends to a bank that is solvent, so their assets are worth more than their liabilities, and they want to lend against good collateral and at a penalty rate. This is to encourage banks to behave well. Um, so that's how a discount window would operate. But the new facility is completely different. Instead of actually lending to banks that are solvent, instead of actually lending against collateral that's of good value, and instead of lending at penalty rates, the new Fed facility actually does this. They don't actually care whether or not you're solvent or not. And they're willing to be severely under collateralized. So if I bought a treasury security at $100 and it's now trading at $80, I can take that treasury security, go to the Fed and borrow $100. The Fed would be under collateralized by twenty dollars, but that's okay. And the, the third thing that's different is that the Fed is offering a rate through the facility that is uh, around in a slightly a little bit less than market rates. So there's no penalty there. So this this facility is basically a huge bailout facility to the commercial banks, and it's really unfortunate too. 
Uh, so we had a great financial crisis in 2008, and thereafter we had this huge change in regulatory regime where uh, the Fed basically, one, they did QE and pumped the banking system full of liquidity, and two, they made all these super tough rules that essentially socialized the banking sector. Um, you know, it, it seems like they had a process in place to make sure things like this don't happen, and if they did happen, they could resolve it, but they just gave up on their system and completely changed the rules of the game and decided to basically just bail everyone out. Mm. Uh, Jack and Joseph, I just want to pause and almost make sure I'm understanding everything that you guys are talking about here. My thought, which is I have the macro brain of a five-year-old here, is that rising rates are a good thing for banks. Um, but Jack, I've, I've been learning on forward guidance that, is that I was actually wrong there um, and that everything in fixed income world bonds, loans, mortgages has the same problem right now, which is you have low coupons. Nobody wants them. You can't sell them except at a loss because of these high interest rates now. And so what the Fed has basically done is embedded trillions of dollars of losses into the market by yanking interest rates higher. I mean, is that is that a correct statement? Yes. The, when people say, and I don't think they're saying it anymore, but they used to say it all the time, that rising rates are good for banks full stop. There's an aspect of that that is right because if interest rates go from 0% to 4%, instead of being able to lend at 1%, you can now lend at 5% if you if you lend, you know, 100 basis points over over treasuries. And that spread gets even wider as interest rates goes goes up. So your income goes up a lot. Uh, however, the, your cost of funds also goes up. So it's it's about that net interest margin, the spread between your your cost of uh, funds and and how much you're you're earning on on your loans. Um but there's the just the securities fact, which is, yeah, if you own a 20 year treasury bond and you own it at a, with a coupon of one and when interest rates are zero, it, you know, it, it can be worth $100. But if interest rates go to, to 5%, it can be worth you know 60 or $70. I'm, I'm just making the numbers up. And then you have mortgage backed securities, which are negatively convex, where the more interest rates up go up, the more sensitive they are. So it's kind of like being short a put option or, or something like that. Uh, it's like being short GameStop. You know, that, that's, a, that's a little drastic. But um, yeah, so so it's, uh, rising rates help bank income, but they are really bad for bank book value, how much the bank is, is actually worth. And uh, now I, I venture far outside my expertise, so I'll turn it over to Joseph. You're exactly right, Jack. It, you know, you're, you're making a really good point as well. So right now at a system-wide level, so interest rates are on 5%, but what are you getting from your checking account? Zero, right? So that's the bank making a very, very big net interest margin. So the bank basically can lend at around 5%. It's paying you 0%. So it's pocketing a lot of a lot of profit there. And bank interest income has been exploding higher with higher rates. But as Jack mentioned, that's not the only thing that matters as well. It also hurts the um, asset values of banks. But that's actually usually not a problem because you don't have to mark your assets to market value. So like in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, you can take stuff, you put it to hold to maturity, and you can just mark it out at whatever you bought it from. So it doesn't actually, even though the market value does decline, it doesn't show up on your financial statements mm -hmm. until until you actually have to sell it for cash. Then you have to go by market value. Everything becomes marked market and you have a big problem. So huh. that's why it's so important that a bank, one, manage its liabilities, and two, the Fed is trying desperately to make sure that there's no banking panic because as long as no one goes and runs from... Uh, let's see, tries to take out their deposit at the same time, uh, eventually the bank's asset values recover and their NIMS will right now hmm. remain healthy. So everybody across Wall Street has losses on fixed income right now, but the difference between SVB and the other banks are that one, they didn't hedge out the risk, but two, other folks are not forced to recognize those losses. They can just kind of sit on those unrecognized losses. Is that correct? And just And just hope that eventually those losses will recover or the equity value will, will eventually match those uh, those losses. But SVB, because of this run, was forced to recognize the losses. Is that yes. okay. exactly right? You're oh, exactly okay. right. So as so that's why it's really important for, for banks to not run. If they don't if they don't have to sell those assets, they don't realize losses. So mm. no run, no selling, no realized losses. And mm. like this chart that Jack is showing here, SVB was really ex spectacular really in, in how high its unrealized losses were. It, that was a choice by management to, to manage the bank like that. And mm. uh, they paid the price. So the, here we're looking at the asset side. Assets is securities plus loans. 
but there's also the liability no, this side. Is, this is just the unrealized losses and securities. So. This is securities, not not loans. Cor- correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is d- the deposits, so the, the liabilities. So you see that you know, over ninety percent of Silicon Valley banks uh, ins- uh, depositors were uninsured, meaning they were held in accounts uh, that held more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. First Republic also, you know, pretty pretty uninsured. Joseph, which matters more, the deposits or the, the liabilities? Because let's say I was a bank owner of a bank that had as imprudent uh, interest rate risk management policies as Silicon Bank. But instead of being sil- uh, headquartered in Silicon Valley, taking money of venture capitalists, um, you know, who invested in companies that are, you know, most of the time unprofitable, meaning they they would keep on withdrawing money unless more venture capital men. Instead, I was in Texas and I was investing in, you know, I was keeping the money of bank uh, of uh, oil companies that were just raking in money. Do you think I would have had the similar would, would I would I would my bank still exist or would I uh, be out of business like the Silicon Valley business? Yeah, no, I think if you manage your liabilities well, you could do terrible things on your asset side and no one would call you for it. So, uh, if if they if they had stable liability base, if they even issued a whole bunch of one year CDs so that no one can just take their money out whenever, that they would have been fine. So, uh, this was a choice from them. Like if you look at that chart that you just showed up, Jack, the uninsured deposits of Silicon Valley Bank was much, much higher than anyone else in their peer group. So that's just that's just a choice that they made. And um, if if they chose differently, maybe they might still be here. Right. But do you also think, Joseph, that there's a degree of this is a sector specific phenomenon where venture capital has you know ruled the world, Silicon Valley has ruled the world for the past 20 years, past 10 years. But right now you have that part of the country is going through a, a rough time because venture capital funding has kind of dried up. So if you know, if I have a, a, a company where I'm you know growing a lot, but I'm unprofitable because venture capitalists, at least they used to, want me to want me to grow, not be profitable, and I'm you know put, putting out more. I'm not my costs are more. You know, yeah, yeah. So uh, that might help as well because like like your example for the Texas oil. If you keep have money flowing in. Then even if you have a lot of uninsured deposits, you still have lots of inflows. So that matters as well. So that's a good point. They are going through kind of a downturn in that area. So you could have people just having less money to uh, to deposit because uh, everything's drying up, and maybe that that has problems as well. But I think the bigger part really is just having liabilities that are stable. It's more difficult to grow if you don't have a booming industry, but that's not the same as having a run. Right. That's a, that's a good point. And then let's just, while we're looking at these charts, these are the unrealized uh, gains or losses on investment securities. So the gold is available for sale that were being marked, whereas the blue were held to maturity that were not being marked, but were added in by this chart. And uh, yeah, this this is kind of the, the, the root of, of the problem, right, Joseph? Uh, for, uh, yeah, this, this definitely, so this is how I look at this. So if you have lots of unrealized losses, you have less uh, market value in which to pawn your securities for liquidity. So it makes it more likely for there to be a liquidity crisis because the market value of your security is dropped. So you can't borrow as much against it. If you had $100 in securities and they're worth 80, that means you can only pawn them for $80 in liquidity. And if you have a lot of people asking for their money back, uh, well, maybe $80 is not enough. So I think that that's how this feeds into this uh, Silicon Valley bank story. Right, one more chart, and then we'll we'll get back to it. Um, this is your your first chart, by the way. All these charts come from uh, FedGuide.com, your most recent article. What are we looking at here? What is HQLA, and what is your conclusion from this? Yeah, so high quality liquid assets are basically cash like assets. So, like I mentioned before, a bank has to have enough assets on hand to meet sudden withdrawals from ca- of cash. So, if you have a lot of high quality liquid assets, it's less likely that there will be a run, or at least you will not. Uh, have to, you will be able to survive the run. Now, what I'm pointing out here is that there's a huge difference in the banking sector today compared to pre-financial crises. Pre-financial crises, the banks did not hold a lot of liquidity on aggregate. Um, that was one of the reasons why the great financial crises happened. The regulators, they basically forced the banks to hold a ton more liquidity. And you can see the results in that chart. Uh, so pre-GFC, you're looking at, let's say, 15% of bank assets were liquid assets. Now it's like 35%. Now that's a huge, huge, huge difference. And so when you're looking at a big bank like JP Morgan or anyone that's highly regulated, for them to fail, it's almost impossible. Right. But Joseph, 
correct me if I'm wrong, included in the high quality liquid assets, it's actual cash. So deposits with the Fed, deposits yep. with other banks, short-term treasuries, but also right long-term treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. So wouldn't SVB qualify, you know, get a, get a AAA rating because wouldn't it, its percentage of high H2LA be off the charts, like 50%, 60%? Definitely, definitely strong point there, Jack. It's not just about this, it's also about the liabilities. This is one measure of it, but you also got to look at liabilities. And yes, totally, SVB would have done very well on the high quality liquid asset ratio. <laughs> Joseph, can we? It sounds um, It sounds like, okay, so Silvergate went down, um, SVB went down, Signature's now been seized, First Republic's down 70%, uh, and the stock got halted, and I heard FDIC is on site. It sounds like you don't think other banks are going to collapse here. Is that my understanding? I think there'll be a strong policy response to, to support the other banks. So what the bank, what the Fed has announced through its facility is unprecedented, being willing to take uh, basically lend undersecured. And that to me shows a very strong commitment to do whatever it takes to make this go away. Uh, one thing that they did was uh, they broke the rules when it comes to when it came to protecting depositors with Silicon Valley Bank. So Silicon Valley. So usually, the FDIC insures only deposits up to two hundred fifty thousand. Those are the rules. They broke those rules and they insured all deposits in Silicon Valley Bank. It it could be because Silicon Valley Bank has, I guess, strong ties with the Biden administration. They are, after all, you know, I have big friends with the tech sector. So. If they're willing to break rules for Silicon Valley Bank, I think it shows that they're willing to cross that line. And it would not be surprising to me if they roll out some kind of larger blanket guarantee of all deposits in the country as a way uh, to stem what we perceive to be a banking panic. And that would be a very effective way to do it. So that's what, that's what you think the response could be here is that the Fed steps in and does a blanket coverage of all deposits, even uninsured deposits? So it would be a joint effort between the Fed the Treasury and the FDIC. So yes, I think that's if this doesn't go away, I mm -hmm. think that's the next strong move and it will it will it will mm -hmm. work one hundred percent. And the way that you're delivering that message to me right now tells me that you disagree with that response. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, listen, man, if you if you have a bad you are a business owner, right? If, <laughs> how would you feel if your competitors were basically supported by the government forever? I right? so we have a market based economy. We want to reward businesses that do a good job and we want to punish businesses that do a bad job. Now, Silicon Valley Bank did a bad job and it's gone. And that has a, that plays a very important role in improving our business sector in general. Now banks see that, gosh, maybe I should take more attention into how I manage my deposit base. That improves resilience of the bank sector. It allows banks to compete. When you, when you do something like this, you're basically socializing all the potential losses of the banking sector. Socializing, but not on the taxpayers, socializing on other banks, right? Oh, no, no, no. At the end of the day, you know, it's, <laughs> it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be paid for um, by, uh, by the Fed or the Treasury, which manifests itself in higher inflation. All right, quick break from the show. There is this kind of overused cliche saying in crypto, but it's true. Bear markets are building and everyone tells you that and everyone knows it. What people don't know is that if you're building apps in crypto and building apps in Web3 without using QuickNode, you are building on hard mode. So QuickNode is, is this amazing blockchain development platform. It reduces costs, streamlines the time to market for your app, and it offers consistent performance at scale. For folks that have built apps, you will know that there are a couple key points here. One, QuickNode offers unlimited endpoints across 18 different chains and 35 different networks. They have response times that are two and a half times faster than any of their competitors, 99.99% .99 uptime and a dedicated 24 seven customer support team. If you've been listening to Empire for a while, you might know that I am no Gigabrain developer, but I do know a lot of devs and a lot of great product teams at other places. So when I see Coinbase and Twitter and Adobe and OpenSea and Dune Analytics, all leveraging and trusting QuickNode to power their business, that's when we get excited and that's when we wanna partner with them. They're the best solution for any leading crypto and Web3 company that is seeking an end-to-end -end blockchain development platform right out of the box. So my message to you, get off hard mode, let QuickNode handle the blockchain infrastructure, let QuickNode handle the security, let QuickNode handle the performance while you focus on building beautiful products for your users. Visit quicknode.com, super easy. You can use code EMPIRE 
you'll get a free month on their build plan. So don't forget to use code Empire. Santi and I got to get credit for this one so they know that we sent you and you will get a first month free. Hope you guys enjoy it. Well, so, yeah. sorry, sorry, but the, what the document said yesterday from the joint statement from the FDIC, Fed, Treasury, and you can disagree with this. I'm not saying it's 100% right, but, and, and President Biden reiterated it today is that uh, the uh, FDIC's guarantee of all deposits, including uninsured, that would be paid by a special surcharge fee on the banks in the future, not by the taxpayers. And then how the Federal Reserve funds it, well, it is backed up with a $25 billion from the Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. But it's not, it's, it's not like, it's not the same as doing QE or, um, you know, like the government buying preferred stakes in 10 banks. Okay. So what happens when the fund, if the fund is not big enough, where does the money come from? Are we just going to say, ah, oh, guys, sorry, no more money. Um, let's, uh, let's give everyone haircuts. And uh, no, it's going to be like, Hey, Jay Powell, I'm um, fire up the printers. So, <laughs> so mm. at the end of the day, you know, this is, this is ultimately backed off by, by the fed and it creates precedent where basically you can behave badly and you will get bailed out. So that that's not the behavior we want to encourage. And more importantly, it makes all the regulatory work we've done in the past 10 years uh, seem silly. Why, why have regulations at all? Let's just bail everyone out. So you would have let SVB just go down. And, and with SVB going down, you would have let these you know thousands of startups go down as well? Just because free, like free the startups? Money. The startups don't go down. Um, I mean, they, they get some of their money back. And uh, now we all learn that we have to manage our cash more prudently. Now, let's be totally clear, though. If you are any competent corporation, you understand that the FDI, your deposits are only FDIC insured up to 250000 Everyone who works as a in the Treasury Department knows this. It's like common sense. So what you would do is you could put some of your money in a money market fund. You could talk with the bank and have a sweep arrangement where all the amounts above 250000 get sweeped into a money market fund or put it into another bank. You can buy treasury bills or you can do some repo transactions and so forth. This is mm. very, very common for a treasury department. There are some very big banks, well, sorry, very big companies who had, it seems reportedly hundreds of millions or even billions in Silicon Valley Bank. And that's just complete, complete, just uh, very poor management. It's just, honestly, if anybody who was just the most junior person on the treasury desk knows that that's just insane. So, you yeah. know, we should not uh, bill people up for their terrible mistakes. So, so Joseph, okay. without any government action other than the regular FDIC process, how many banks do you think would have failed? And with the package that was rolled out yesterday, as well as what maybe you see coming down coming down the the, the bike, how many fail how many more failures do you think we have? Do you think that's the the failure of Signature Bank, the takeover by the FDIC yesterday? Do you think that was the last one? So one thing in common with all these banks is that they dabbled in crypto and they dabbled in high tech, right? So just like the fortune, just like their clients, they kind of went down with that industry. So I think that gives you a clue as to how widespread it can be. So I don't really worry about other banks. And like I, like I mentioned, I anticipate that if this doesn't go away, they would just bring out the super, super big bazooka and that will make everything go away. Hmm. So you... Uh if you are a betting man here, Joseph, you are actually probably buying assets right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I am, I am buying assets right now. Some, but you know, mm. I, I don't think that this is a big deal. Mm. I we think that. We'll, yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah. So listen, we had we went through the great financial crisis, right? It's a banking crisis. So now, whenever someone sees a bank going, going bust, they have flashbacks, and I think that's what this is. Hmm. I'm doing my hardest to resist uh, your crypto comment, Joseph, but we'll. Uh, We'll move back. <laughs> um, I, I've heard you say I forget. I forget if it was on Jack's show, if it was on Forward Guidance, um, or or on Twitter or somewhere else, or maybe in one of your writings. But I've heard you say that the Fed is going to hike and hike and hike and run, uh, and and just continue hiking until something breaks. I've heard you use that term until something breaks. This seems like something breaking. So, like, is this the thing that you've been looking out for? And do you think that this is, I mean, a rate of priced in like do you like how does this change your view on 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 uh rate hikes so so we had so if you look at the market today you will see a very big change in how the market is pricing fed expectations 
Yeah. Interest rates have gone down a lot. And uh, if you look at the 10 year, it's back at 3.5%. So what's happened is that monetary financial conditions have eased a lot. Monetary conditions have eased. Now, if this persists, you can go out and get a mortgage or maybe around a five handle soon. It was about 7% basically uh, just a few days ago. So what's happening is that um, the underlying real economy inflation dynamics, I, in my view, are not really affected by this. So a, a bank in Silicon Valley that lends to a lot of venture capitalists went bust. How does that affect the shortage of labor and so forth? It doesn't really affect that. How does that affect, let's say, commodity prices? It doesn't really affect that that much as well. Uh, what it does do is that it makes the market think that rate cuts are coming, and that means that borrowing costs go down, and that means that everything that the Fed tried to do to stop the market, to stop the economy from heating up, goes back down. So mortgage rates go back down, housing can reaccelerate, and so forth. So um, this is very much, in my view, a financial economy disruption. It doesn't actually affect the real economy, and the real economy is where inflation lives. Um, it uh, it actually, I think, makes Fed's job more difficult because now that the market is expecting rate cuts, and that means that borrowing rates go lower, asset prices go higher, and inflation could potentially reaccelerate. Mm. Yeah, it feels like worst of all worlds, right? You're you're committed yeah, they're in a to suicide by by this word bailing out the banks or whatever you want to call you know, replace bailout with like backstop or something, and you're reinjecting the system with liquidity. And you still have inflation. It's kind of a nightmare situation for the Fed. Yeah, they, yeah. So they they definitely need this to go away. Everyone forget about it, and then they can go back to hiking mm -hmm. rates. Yeah, <laughs> got to imagine Biden is not too happy with uh, Jay Powell right now. <laughs> well, his I, speech yeah. was like four minutes long, and he didn't <laughs> have questions. Biden's speech today. I think this is actually something that is probably bigger in their world than it is in the real world. And let me explain. So this is actually a bank that banks with a lot of Silicon Valley people, right? A lot of tech people. These guys are very vocal on Twitter. These guys are friends with people in the Biden administration. These guys are the people that we see on TV. Uh, but they're actually a very, very small part of the economy. So I think their disproportionate representation uh, gives it more actually weight than it's actually worth. I just want to like triple triple check this and like get your gut check one more time here, Joseph. You do not think that this will spill over into regional banks nor the large systematic banks like J.P. Morgan. Both of the large, the large systematic banks, definitely no zero yeah. chance. Okay. Other regional banks, we're seeing a little bit of that now, right? First yeah, Republic and so forth. I I don't think I I think that's probably as far as it, it uh, spills over. Hmm. So Silicon Valley Bank, I mean. It's a, it's, it's a bank in Silicon Valley, so it's First Republic. But you go to look at other banks, regional banks, you know, Fifth Third or uh, BMO and so forth. They're in different regions. And honestly, I'm not even sure that all those people who bank there um, pay all that much attention to what happens in, in the news or on Silicon Valley. And also, like I mentioned before, their depositor base is largely insured. So there's no reason for their depositors to run. So Joseph, earlier you said that the market pricing out uh, rate hikes, the two-year rallying close to 100 basis points in three or four days, incredible, that that was going to ease financial conditions because now borrowing will be easier. Uh, however, you know, this morning I was uh, watching a Bloomberg and they put up the, the financial conditions index, which tightened dramatically over the past few days. And you're absolutely right about risk-free rates, but total financial conditions are, you know, where's the stock market, credit spreads, bank uh, lending tightening uh, standards and, you know, in the same way that March in March 2020, interest rates were at zero, but financial conditions were not loose, right? Because, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, the treasury yields was, were at zero. But if you, you know, if you were Warren Buffett, you couldn't, you couldn't issue a bond. It was, it was liquidity. I'm not suggesting we're anywhere near there, but it, you know, let's say, you know, and I, I hope this is the case that First Republic makes it, makes it through. If they do, I mean, do you think the mortgage department is pulling out more mortgages? Do you think that there isn't going to be a tightening of credit going throughout the banking sector? Um, so my interpretation of this event, uh, it's just because there is a run on Silicon Valley Bank uh, because, uh, you know, poor managed liabilities, poor managed assets, I think it's idiosyncratic. I think that if you are a bank in another region, you look at your, uh, someone look, asking for a loan, you see wages going higher. Listen, wages have been going higher a lot. There's tightness in the labor market. What happened the past three days doesn't actually change that. 
Uh, so no. And if you are a someone trying to buy a home, honestly, you look at the mortgage rates going down and they will go down because look, the 10 year, 10 years down 50 basis points in like a few days. More people won't go to ask for loans. That means more money flowing to housing. That means construction layoffs get postponed and so forth. So, um, and as I look at uh, the S&P 500 right now, it looks like it's up percent as well. Yeah. So again, our financial conditions are easing as we speak. And you make a good point about things like credit spreads. Uh, but, you know, Silicon Valley Bank is a tiny regional bank that if you are a corporate bond, corporate issuer, you don't really borrow from anyway. If you're a corporate issuer, you borrow from the capital markets. Your costs are indexed to treasury yields, which have gone down significantly. Right. So I just want to say, so absolutely, uh, S&P 500 is actually up on the day. And since we res we started recording, when when we started recording, the KBW regional bank index was down something like 10%. But since then, it's rallied 8% over the course of our conversation. So now it's only down 3.2% on the day. Wow. So the Joseph yeah. Wang thesis this is working out yet again <laughs> so far. Uh, this isn't live. I was thinking they just listen to this and start buying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, hey, Joseph and Jack, I have a more esoteric question for you guys, um, which is about the Fed's role in society. It feels like the Fed has, in my lifetime, has only gotten stronger and just stronger and stronger and more influential and more influential and more like active instead of like passive here. And when I look at what's happening today, I mean, you go back to March 2020. Uh, Fed injects a, bun a whole bunch of liquidity into the system that drives inflation. Fed then has to respond to their earlier actions by yanking interest rates higher. Now that causes these, uh, you know, we, we, we probably yank too high too quickly. That causes this kind of stuff that happened today. Now the Fed has to respond with the Treasury and the FDIC and step in. It feels like we're playing this game of like every 12 months, the Fed just has to respond to their actions of 12 months prior. And it makes me think about this broader question of like, what is the Fed's role and responsibility in society? And I would just be curious to hear how you guys think about that. Uh, it's greeting the financial system, of course. <laughs> so listen, you make a really good point that the Fed is has become increasingly important in society and it's basically giving itself new jobs. So at the very beginning, the Fed was basically just lender of last resort in the banking sector. Okay, that's great. Uh, but fast forward to today, today it's, it's, it has a much more expanded role. It's lender of last resort to the treasury market. It's lender of last resort to the corporate bond market, lender of last resort to foreign banks in the Eurozone as well. So that they've basically grown and grown and grown. Now they're also talking about trying to do things like, oh, we got to make sure that, you know, uh, there's sufficient inclusion and diversity in, in the economy. We got to make sure that we have a green financial system and so forth. So they're becoming more involved in things that are not what they're in originally intended to be. And part of that is because, as you suggested, they've become more influential. This is because of two reasons. One is that the financial, we are a more financialized economy. So, you know, let's take a hundred years ago, uh, there was a stock market and so forth, but now there's stock markets, bond markets, a lot of, let's say, shadow banking and so forth. Um, and they've grown a lot more and they are heavily dependent upon what the Fed does. And so the Fed has a lot more influence through what it does. And of course, there is the global dollar system. So the Fed has influence as to what happens abroad as well. And the banking sector has to become a lot more uh, influential as well. So the Fed can influence the banking sector through regulations. For example, one thing they're thinking about doing is evaluating a bank as to how green they are. So for example, they can make it more costly for banks to offer loans to, let's say, oil and gas, or more cheap for banks to offer loans to, let's say, a solar company. And this lever of influence allows them to directly impact um, real economy stuff. And so because the Fed has so much power, you have more people lobbying them. And you also, you have them trying to, you know, take advantage of, of this. And some, some, some governors at the Fed are more active in doing this than others. And potentially they could roll out a central bank digital currency, which would even more greatly expand their potential reach. If that were to, ha were to happen, you would have deposits not at your local bank, but at the Fed. So, um, you know, the Fed will basically have more control over um, what you're able to buy and potentially, uh, you know, influence more behavior through that. So, you know, the Fed's role in society, I think, needs to be discussed and debated more 
I think it's really grown uh, because people don't feel like, don't understand it as much, but they've really grown in a way that is beyond what the uh, their legislation originally intended. So it's a discussion we definitely should have. Uh, that was so eloquent, Jason. There's, there's nothing I could possibly add uh, on onto what, what Jason, uh, um, what Joseph said. I, I've got a question for, for Joseph, which is: so Let's assume that you're right that the liquidity situation for deposits is not systemic; it's idiosyncratic. A, you know, a few bad apples, as, as you said on Twitter. By the way, on Twitter, you're at FedGuy12. Uh, what about the price of deposits? Do you think that okay, yes, even though these these banks are not going to go down, they you know two weeks ago they were getting they were, had a trillion dollars in deposits at 50 basis points. Now they're going to have to pay 170 basis points and that's going to eat into their profitability. I know you had been bullish on the bank sort of you, 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 uh, before this um, because of that, you know, NIM was wide, but do you think NIMs are going to have to narrow now? So that, that's, that's definitely possible. What you could see happen, and this is something that I'm, I'm speculating on, is that you could have larger depositors who become more worried about the stability of their bank, take some money out and put more of it in the money market fund. Now, money market funds are offering around four and a half, five percent 5%. So when a lot of people do that, that means the banks have more competition. They are going to have to have to offer higher deposit rates and that could eat into their profitability. So that's definitely something that's that, that could happen. I think we don't have, I mean, so all this episode just happened the past over the past few days. So we're going to have to look at data over the next coming weeks to see if that actually does play out. Joseph, what what is that data that you're paying attention to? Like what oh, are the okay. most important as, as we look forward? Actually, if you if you if you an easy way to look at this is just look at the Fed's reverse repo facility. Is it going to slightly tick higher over the next few weeks? If it, if it does, that means there's people taking money out of their local bank. They don't feel safe. They put it yeah. in a money market fund. The money market fund puts it in the reverse repo facility, and that's yeah. available daily. So it's actually pretty good data. I guess as we think about wrapping this up, like what are the um, for folks who don't have access to go speak to uh, Fed Guy Twelve every day? What are uh, what are the main things that we we should be paying attention to? Is yeah, it, so I think there feels like there's so much mania on Twitter right now. What what are the things that we should be paying attention to? So uh, two things I would take away. One is that um, the government seems like they're willing to do whatever it takes to backstop this. So I wouldn't worry about, uh, let's say, your bank going under or anything like that. The second thing is that um, until this is out it's just, as it is now, you should still think about managing your cash uh, better. So what I noticed through the Silicon Valley Bank incident were, were that many smaller companies who maybe were not as sophisticated actually thought that if they put money in the bank, it'd be safe forever. That's not true, as we can see. So I would if you were someone who has more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on deposit at a bank, I would think about different ways of managing your cash. Put it in a money market fund. Uh, put it in uh, another bank. Put, spread it among different banks. Buy some treasury bills and so forth. But investing in a bank, you know, past the guarantee is is not risk free. So you have to manage your cash more carefully. Uh, I've got a final question, pretty nerdy question, which is, you know, Joseph, we're told all the time that the primary engine of credit creation and money printing is at commercial banks, which, you know, is, there's definitely a lot of, of truth to that. But if banks can print money and they can create deposits from thin air by just giving people loans, how is it possible that there can ever be a run on the bank? Why couldn't Silicon Valley Bank have said, oh, person one, here's a million dollar credit line, person two, here's a million dollar credit line, and then just sustain themselves that way? Yeah, banks do create money out of thin air, but when they create a money out of money out of thin air, they have to be able to redeem that one for one for, you know, government money. So, let's say hundred dollar bills. So that's that's kind of one of the challenges of a bank. You create money, but the money you create, you have to be able to redeem that one for one for, let's say, cash. And uh, if you don't manage your liquidity well enough, then you can create a lot more money than you have cash or assets available to back that and you can go bust. And that's seems to be what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Got it. Thank you. Jason, what, while we have him here, you, do, do you want to ask a crypto question to, to Joseph? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I guess, have you been paying attention to the USDC? There are like two crypto things I think folks are paying attention to right now, Joseph. There's USDC, which seems to be doing much better after falling to uh, the peg broke and fell to 89 cents on the dollar over the weekend. Um, and then the other big thing is uh, a lot of the kind of crypto friendly banks, Signature, Silvergate, have now been seized and have 
kind of been closed. And I'm just curious to, I don't know how closely you pay attention to, to crypto. Yeah, no, I'm not super close, but I, I would be, so you know what this could be. So, okay. Government could be trying to uh, crack down a bit on, on crypto. So this could be a, a way of them doing that. So again, one of the, I think choke points in crypto is the on-ramps from um, fiat to crypto. And when you crack down on these banks, those on-ramps disappear. Yeah. Do you think it's reasonable that, so I, I was uh, looking at Signature's balance sheet, trying to figure out how much of their deposits actually came from crypto companies. And the number I kind of came to was around 20 to 25%, somewhere like 23% of their deposits came from crypto companies, which is less than a quarter, obviously, but it's one of the main on-ramps and off-ramps for crypto companies. Do you think it's reasonable that, I mean, the, the I, I don't know the regulatory body, I don't know if it was the Fed or the Treasury or FDIC who, who kind of took them down here, but do you think it's, is it a thing that could happen that they, they kind of used this whole chaos uh, scenario to sweep the takedown of Signature under the rug? Is that from your understanding of how kind of the inner workings of all this work? I think it varies from an administration to administration. It's totally possible. I mean, it just kind of happened in the background, right? Everyone's right. focusing on Silicon Valley Bank and this bank just poof, disappeared. I mean, for all I know, maybe they they maybe they maybe strongly recommended that they close and that gave them more justification to, to yeah. roll out their new facility and bail out Silicon Valley Bank's depositors. I, there could be a lot of things happening in the background. I, I, I really don't know. Would you be worried about USDC next? Uh, I think that uh, the government doesn't like competition, so you got to keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's a scary place to end it, but I think probably a good place to end it. Unless, Jack, you have anything else here? No, I, I this is perfect. I'm so glad, uh, Jason, thanks for having me, and I'm, I'm really glad we got Joseph. Joseph, thanks so much. Yeah, for it's a pleasure meeting you, Jason. Thanks for inviting me on your show. Of course. This is a lot of fun. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks, Jack. <laughs>